Welcome to Journey. We are going to continue this series we've been going in called Entrapment and trying to be aware of the enemy's schemes and how he wants to get us on a detour through setting traps. And we've been anchored in John chapter 21, looking at the life of Peter and different traps that were set for him. And he fell into some of them, but he also came out of them, which is good news for us. And so today I'm going to be talking about some things that may be a little difficult for us to process when we first hear them, but I believe that as we, we wrestle with these things, that, that God can do a work in us. And so I, I just want to pray and, you know, let's all just kind of, you know, get a posture to say, God, I want to hear what you have to say. So Lord, we just come to you today and we just say, God, we want to have open hearts and open ears. And God, I pray that for my words that you would use my words. And if I that you would speak through me, that you would uh, let people hear what needs to be heard. And, and if there's anything that needs to be redirected in my words, that Holy Spirit, you would come and just speak in real time through this moment. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. How many of you guys have ever seen that movie, The Born Identity? Anybody ever seen that movie? All right, a lot of you guys have, have seen that. All right, if you haven't seen it, Basically, it's the idea, just give me the short summary. Basically, it's this idea of a guy who wakes up, he has amnesia, he doesn't know anything about himself, and the whole movie essentially is him trying to really wake up to his true identity to discover who he really is. He doesn't know. And so along the way, he's like, he's discovering more and more of his identity and waking up to his true identity. And so when we're talking about Peter today, I want you to see this story of Peter where I think in the story, he loses some of his identity. And in John chapter one, 21, Jesus is trying to reawaken him to his identity. How have you guys have ever lost your identity? Like identity theft. Somebody used your identity. I have. They tried to use my identity. It's one thing to have somebody steal your identity and misuse your identity. And it's another thing to be living a wrong identity and not even know it. And that's really what I want to deal with today, is that maybe there's something in us that could wake up today. Maybe we're similar to that movie where there's some parts of us that are going to wake up. That's my hope. So let's go to John chapter 21 and verse 3. Jesus, you know, this is after the resurrection. Jesus has appeared to the disciples uh, in different ways, but they're kind of, you know, all over the board trying to figure out what to do with life now. And Peter says this, he, Simon Peter said to them, he says, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we'll go with you. And so they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. How many of you guys have been there before? Okay. You know, so you're in good company. This happens in the Bible too. So he caught nothing. And just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they cast it on the, uh, cast it on the right side and now they were able to not even haul it all in because of the quantity of fish. And that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea and then he jumps in and then has this breakfast, this fish breakfast with Jesus. How many guys were here last week and you, we talked about the fish breakfast with Jesus, right? So then that's when the fish breakfast happens, right? And so Peter had, he started out as a fisherman. He goes back to being a fisherman. And somewhere in this chapter, Jesus is trying to re reawaken him to his true identity. And so today I want to talk about the trap of a co-opted identity. Now let me just kind of define co-opted, how we're using it today. It's really when something is being taken over or being used for a different purpose than originally intended. And so Peter's identity, I, I believe for a moment, gets co-opted back to a different identity that Jesus pulled him out of. And maybe it was through comparison, like we talked about a few weeks ago. Maybe it was through compromise, like we talked about last week. It could be through condemnation, you know, they felt like condemnation for denying Jesus. It could be from some confusion in his life as he's trying to figure out life. But nonetheless, he, he goes and he steps away from this identity that Jesus gave him. And, and it, to see that, we have to go back to the very beginning when Jesus called Peter. What we find here is this story in John chapter 21 is, I mean, almost to a T, the exact way that Jesus and Peter first meet. 
So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's see the parallels here and let's see what happens. Luke chapter 5, verse 4. And when he'd finished speaking, Jesus had borrowed their boats to go out and to speak. He doesn't really know them yet. And he said to Simon, he says, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. How do you guys know? This sounds familiar, right? This is the way it happened at the beginning, the first time they met. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish so that the nets were breaking. Does this sound familiar? It's, it's almost like the same story happening over again. And they signaled to their partners out in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled the boats and they began, so that they began to seek so many fish. But when Simon, you know, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, and who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. This is their key moment. This is the very beginning. He says to Peter, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Now that seems really strange, but what he was saying is, your identity now is not to be a fisherman. Your identity is to be a fisher of men. In other words, I'm going to change your identity. Now your whole purpose has shifted. Okay, do you guys see that? Now, identity is so important. Why is identity important? Knowing who you are, it's so important. And here's why, it's so important. And I want you to catch this. This is gonna be kind of a lens through which I want you to see some things today. And maybe you can apply this to several areas of your life. And here's why identity is so important. It's because the who informs the what and the way. Let me say that again. The who informs the what and the way. Let's see it in this story, how this plays out. Next verse. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. So Jesus says, your who is now shifted. You are now a, not a fisherman, you're a fisher of men. That who affected his what. what? What happened? It says, and now it says that they left everything. The who informed his what. And then it says, and they followed Jesus, which informed the way they were going to do the what. Is everybody following me today, right? All right, so your who informs the what and way. And so I want to talk today about your who, <laughs> the kingdom who. If you are following Jesus, what is your who, if I could say it that way? Or I, maybe I'll just get a little more straightforward. Who are you? Have you ever thought about that? Who are you? And if we're honest and we look at it objectively, we have all a bunch of identities, right? I mean, how many, how many fathers do we have in the building? Any, any fathers we got in the building? All right, that, that's an identity. You are a father, right? Mothers, let's see the hands of the mother. You are, that's, that's completely true. That's, that's your identity. You are a mother. We, we have, you, know, you could be male, female. You could be a businessman, a businesswoman. For me, I'm a pastor, American, you could be an American. That's, that's true about your identity. All of these things, a dad, a brother, a, you know, all of these things, husband, wife, are all identities that we have. And how many of you guys know that all of those identities that you have are simultaneously true? They all are true at the same time. Because for me, I'm a husband. That's my identity. I'm I'm a male, I'm a father, I'm an American, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a pastor, I'm all of these things, right? They're all simultaneously true. All the identities. How many of you guys are with me so far? I'm laying a foundation here for where we're going. Confusion happens when we live as if all identities are equal. So I could say I'm a father. Okay, well, what kind of father am I? Because if I try to live from that identity solely to inform my what and my way, I might come up short because there are all kinds of fathers. There are good fathers, there are bad fathers, there are present fathers, there's absent fathers. There's all kinds of fathers. All right, well, I could say I'm a pastor. Well, what kind of pastor am I? How, is that enough to inform my what and my way. I could say I'm an American. Well, what kind of an American am I? Is that information enough of a who to inform my what and my way? 
See, confusion happens whenever we treat all identities, even though they are all simultaneously true about us, but whenever we treat them all as equal, confusion begins to happen. And this is what a lot of us do, is we like, well, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm an American, I'm a Christian, I'm all of these things at the same time. And so we try to live simultaneously from all of those things. And so what I want to say today is this, I'll put it up on the screen. All identities do not carry the same weight. All identities, we can say it this way, the weightiest identity should inform all other identities. Or your highest identity should be the one that informs all other identities. And so if you look at all of your identities, now we have to ask the question, what is my weightiest, highest identity now that I'm a follower of Jesus? Of course, we, we just have to go to scripture for that, right? Philippians chapter three, verse 20 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait a way to Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've signed up for this, let me give you your who, okay? This is your who. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, right? You are an ambassador of the kingdom of God now. You are a follower of Jesus. So that identity now is the highest that get raised up above every other identity that you have, and it becomes what informs all other identities. See, the highest identity now informs the identity that I have as a father. Can somebody say amen? See, my highest identity now gives me my what and my way to be a father. My highest identity now gives me my what and my way on how to be a husband. My highest identity now gives me my what and my way on how to be an American. Right? See, I can't treat them all as equal. I have to allow my highest and my weightiest identity become what informs my what in my way in every other identity. And so Peter assumed that his fisherman identity was equal with his fisher of man identity. And he finds out that he was wrong, that that's not how it works. Jesus calls him out of that. And he says, no, I've called you to a different identity. Now watch, Paul even takes it further, though. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 28, he says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How many of you guys have been baptized into Christ? The majority of us here, I assume. So he goes on and makes an interesting statement. He's like, now that you're in Christ, here's what it looks like. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter what your nationality is, your origin, what your, what, it doesn't matter whether you're on the highest social status or the very lowest and in a situation that is so horrible. It doesn't matter your social status now that you're in Christ. It doesn't even matter if you're male and female, and I'll explain that here in just a little bit. It doesn't matter because all you are one in Christ. What is he saying by that? He's saying your highest identity informs where you live. Your highest identity informs even that you are a son or a daughter or a male or a female. It's that highest identity that now informs every other way, the what and the way. Is anybody following me today? We all right? All right. The, he, the Bible even talks about in heaven, neither mar- we won't be given in marriage or even marriage. So it's a little confusing there, but what is he saying? I believe what is being said here is that your highest identity is what is going to live for eternity. It's your highest identity. identity. And so all of these other identities are less weighty, and that has implications for how we live. All right, so I'm going to go and just use this example of, let me just step into politics for just a second, okay? Why do I do that? Because it's something we're all talking about. You know, we got an election coming up, right? And we tend to all talk about these things, except for we don't want to talk about them through the lens of the kingdom. Well, how about we talk about it through the lens of the kingdom? Shouldn't we do that as believers, right? All right, so let's talk about that. So what would that look like as I'm a follower of Jesus and my who How does my who now inform how I engage in this area? It has implications. And so I'm going to let one of my pastors in my life, Dwayne Vanderklok, uh, who started the Link organization that we're all a part of and everything, but he recently talked about this, and he talked about how we should vote, and we should vote coming up. We should be informed. But what does that look like? From which place? Well, let's take a look. Let's watch. Only one minute long. Let's watch. You look at your Bible, and you decide. 
Which is the biblical? Which is the biblical stance? Because I am not foremost a libertarian or a Republican or a Democrat. I am foremost a Christian. Jesus, Jesus came to establish, listen, the kingdom of God. The Bible says of his government, there will be no end. We in Western society tend to think of Christianity as simply getting us to heaven. But what Jesus came proclaiming was the kingdom of God. He said, pray your kingdom come. And and I'm not going to add to scripture, but I think if, if I could say this, I would say invoke your kingdom come. All right. So what is, if, if we have our kingdom, who, what is the kingdom? What? And this is where it gets a little more complex and complicated. And I'm not going to spend time laying all of these things out and all the issues. I will just hit a couple just to give us a, an, a glimpse in how we can process things. Okay, So understand, I'm not able to hit every single issue that, that would take way too long. But again, we don't borrow from other identi- identities to inform how we live. We live from our weightiest identity to inform all others. So when it comes to being engaged in something like politics, what do we do? We don't let a lesser identity inform how we interact. We let our highest and weightiest identity inform all others. So I could say it this way. If you're an American, you you are more a citizen of the kingdom of God than you are an American. Right? I, I mean, this is the basic stuff, but I know how controversial it can seem in today's culture. You are more a, a, a citizen of the kingdom of God than you are an American. This may, let me just burst somebody's bubble. You're not going to be an American in heaven. There's an expiration date on this, you know? And sometimes we live as if that's going to be what we are forever. That's not true. So if that's true, and our highest, weightiest identity is the kingdom, then you have more in common. If you're a believer, you have more in common with a believer in Jesus who lives in China than you do with your next-door neighbor who's a non-believer, as far as identity goes, right? It's that powerful, right? It's that significant. Our identity is that weighty and that, that transformative that that becomes true. So the who then now has to inform the what. And so let's just stay in this realm here just for illustration. I understand it's, it's complex, okay? But let's just go there to kind of wrestle with some things today. So what are some of the things that would be kingdom things as we step into that area to, to use, to, to exercise our freedom and our influence and our ability to have opportunity? All right, what are some of the what's? Psalms chapter 139, verse 13. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. My, your eyes saw my unformed substance. Your, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So when I look at an issue that's being talked about very prominently, where do I go? I go back to my kingdom identity. That's the kingdom is for life. So that's why we speak up for the unborn. As kingdom people, we do that because our identity is not in culture. Our identity goes back to scripture. And the scripture talks about life in this way. So Again, I understand there's complexities. I understand there's, there's a lot of conversations we can have about that. But when I go back to it, I have to go to my highest and weightiest identity to inform how all other identities play out. Is everybody with me, right? And so that's why we as believers speak up for the unborn. That's why we as believers are, are you know, for those issues. But let me ask you a question. Would it be possible... For, what, for a lesser identity to co-opt that particular issue and use it for a different purpose than what we as kingdom people would use it for. 
Boy, it got really quiet in here. Of course it is. Of course it's possible. Of course it happens. Of course some of the lesser identities would use it for maybe a different purpose than what we as believers would be anchored to. So what do we do? We constantly are aware to be discerning, to step back and say, am I living this from my highest identity or have I shifted into one of my lesser identities to, you, to be able to be involved in this purpose? Is everybody following me today? I always go back to why am I doing this? What is informing my passion for this process here? Is it my highest, weightiest identity? Or have I gone with one of my lesser identities in order to inform this topic? All right, let's keep going. Because the kingdom is for life, but it's not just in the womb. The kingdom, by the way, is womb to tomb. It's life all the way. And see, if I'm only informed by one of my lesser identities, I may miss out on some of that. So let's look. What is the kingdom? If we're going to go back to the kingdom, let's just go there. James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So that's why we as believers, we speak up for the less fortunate. We speak up for the least of these, for the last, for the lost, for the least, for those who are vulnerable. Why do we do that? Not because it's a particular issue that somebody's talking about, but it's because we're informed by the kingdom, right? Is everybody with me? We're informed by the kingdom. So we speak up for these issues. So when we engage, let's say when we engage in politics, not only are the unborn on our heart, but also, if we're going to go there, then these other issues now become on our heart, too. And it gets really complex really quickly, doesn't it? And it goes even further. Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. Jesus says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And so here we have an example of the, the least, the lost, the, you know, all of these things that Jesus is for, that the kingdom is for. So if I want to engage in a process and I have opportunity to engage in something, what am I going to go to? One of my lesser identities to inform how I do that? Or am I going to appeal to my highest identity in order to, whenever I'm pray, prayerful about how to engage, these things are also on my heart. Is anybody with me? Did I lose you guys? And some might say, well, you know, the government needs to stay out of those things. Isn't it interesting how some people feel like the government should stay out of the things they don't want them to be in, but want them to be really involved in the things they want them to be in, right? But again, if we're being, come on, let's be intellectually honest here for just a moment. If we're saying my highest and weightiest identity comes from my identity as a believer, then it has to be across the board, my identity, right? I don't cherry pick what I want and what I don't want. That's being informed by a lesser identity, right? And so therefore it's complex, isn't it? But we always go back. What is my highest? What is my weightiest identity? Now, here's the good news. Because even though these, these are complex issues that we're dealing with, the good news is, is that even though that's, you know, because some people are like, oh, that whole system's just a mess. And, and that's true. There's a lot of times it's just a mess. And, and you're like, you throw up your hands, you're like, oh, I don't know if there's anything good that's ever going to come out of it. Here's the thing, we, we should vote, we should be engaged, we should be involved. Why? Because we're believers, we have opportunity. We should use our opportunity for good. We should use our opportunity to uh, promote laws that are going to protect the vulnerable, that are going to promote good in the world. We should use, if we have opportunity, let us do good. That's what the scripture says, right? But even, even if none of that happens, even if we don't have an influence, even if nothing changes, here, here's the thing. I, I, the aim of the kingdom is not for the church to run the country. The aim of the kingdom is for God's reign to rule every heart. See, if you were to, if, if you were to live in a Muslim country, or maybe if laws were passed in this country that were to make you live like a Muslim, would that change your heart as a follower of Jesus? Of course not. So why do we sometimes get so consumed with this idea that, if we, that the kingdom would come if laws changed? 
Man, I'm preaching a lot better than you guys are amen today, okay? I'm just telling you. If you don't like what I'm preaching, is it because it's not biblical or you just don't like it? I'm just wanting to know. Of course it wouldn't. So should we encourage those things? Absolutely. We should influence. We should encourage good. But even if, here's what I'm saying. The kingdom of God is never at the mercy of the kingdoms of this world. Every major revival that I know of came apart from the government's help. So the good news is the kingdom of God is going to come whether any of that stuff happens or not. We, we don't need Jesus to be president before the kingdom comes. When Jesus first came, that was their mistake. They thought, man, Jesus, you're going to start a kingdom. He's like, no, I'm not starting an earthly kingdom the way you think it's going to happen. I'm not working through that system. They thought they were trying to make Jesus the Messiah into Jesus as Caesar. And he's like, no, I don't work that way. So the kingdom of God is not dependent on the kingdoms of this world. And so when we vote, which you should, by the way, you should get out your Bible. You should invite the Holy Spirit into the room. You should look at the issues. And as best you can, it's not going to be perfect, as best you can, with honesty before God and with, with the scripture informed by your highest identity, you do the best you can to influence for good, all the while knowing that even if none of, nothing happens in this world, in that world, that the kingdom of God is still on the move. Amen. So that's how we approach that. Now, but it's even more important than that. It's more important than all of that is not just how we engage in that area, but it's that if if this is our highest identity, it informs the what and the who, that these things ought to be involved, we ought to be engaged in these things outside of politics and in our everyday life. That if we're for speaking up for the last and the least and protecting and promoting good and cultivating good rather than evil, it ought to permeate all of our life, not just our political life, right? And so at Journey Church, we have opportunities all the time for this to happen, you know, to, to support widows and orphans and to, to help the less fortunate and to speak life and to protect. We have all these different opportunities. And so one of the, I'm going to, I'm going to show a video of something that we participate in called Care Portal. It's to, to help in this area. And I just want to show it to you because, yes, it's an opportunity you can be involved. It's not a commercial, but uh, if you want to be involved, you can. But I just want to show it to you as an example of things that ought to be on our heart all the time, right? All the time. So let's watch. Every year, more than 4 million children teeter on the brink of entering foster care. And more than 400,000 are in foster care, most of them for preventable reasons. The foster care system impacts more than you can imagine. 50% of the homeless, 60% of girls and women rescued from sex trafficking raids, and 75% of those incarcerated spent time in foster care. The foster care system is ground zero, the place where our efforts will have the absolute greatest impact on our communities. And here is the good news. So many of you care about these issues. Churches and agencies and businesses, community leaders all want to help. What we're missing is connection. The chance to collaborate and put our networks and resources together. Care Portal uses technology to make real-time care connections for kids and families in crisis. This platform helps us make the most vulnerable children our priority, which makes them the single most powerful source for uniting and healing our communities as we serve together. Here's how it works. Caseworkers with child serving agencies encounter needs of children in crisis every day. They enter vetted needs into Care Portal, which immediately makes local churches and community members who've joined the network aware, giving them a real time opportunity to respond. This platform is designed to equip the local church to be at the point of care for these children and families in need. And it allows for the entire community to work together on any request. So whether it's one church that responds or a community of churches and businesses and individuals working together, Care Portal makes vital connections possible through an easy to use platform at your fingertips. 
So many of our children and families in child welfare are isolated. They don't have a support system. Care Portal can provide not only the physical needs for the children and family, but can also provide a support system and relationships. I look at the Care Portal as a platform for us to be able to do ministry uh, across denomination lines, across racial lines, across social economic lines, and the mission field is in our backyard. Sometimes, Connection means meeting one need at just the right moment. At other times, connection starts life-changing relationships. When you join Care Portal, you're saying yes to connections that change lives, transform communities, and can reverse the foster care crisis in our nation. That yes makes children the priority because every child matters and what you do matters. Children have the power change us. It's good stuff. If you want to be involved in that, you can just email outreach at journeykc.com. You can get plugged into that. I showed that probably because you needed a break from my preaching, but also just to, just to make you aware that this ought to be on our hearts, all right? So it's not just womb, it's womb to tomb. So we're not, what, what I do is not informed by lesser identities, it's informed by my highest and my weightiest identity. See, when I understand where my what gets orders from, things become a lot more clear. Whenever I understand where the orders come for my what, and then it's not just the what, but it's the what and way, because the who informs the what and way. So let's talk, as we wrap up here, the kingdom way. We looked at some of the what, and by the way, you can use that for a lot of things. Just put it through that matrix, the, my who is informing my what. Now, what about the way, the kingdom way? Jesus said that the way is narrow. And so let's just go back and let's just step back into that area of our politics for just a second. I'll use some other examples real quick because uh, some of you guys are tired of that. I can tell on your faces. But um, when I want to engage in, in uh, the political world, which we have opportunity to do, as a believer now, since I signed up for Jesus, my options become narrower for how I can do that as opposed to somebody who's not a follower of Jesus. The way I can engage is different because I'm, a, I'm now a follower of Jesus because the way is now informed by my who, right? So Jesus said the way is narrow. So there are some ways that I could engage in politics that are off limits now that I'm a follower of Jesus. And the same goes, let's just go for our money for a second. My who informs what I do with my money and the way or the why I do it, right? We can put this in every, every area of our life. I'm just using this one example because I knew I'd get your attention, right? So the who informs what I'm to do in my marriage and the way I'm to do it. Because I'm a follower of Jesus, my what and my, my way has become narrower in a good, healthy way, right? So what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, for one, the end does not justify the means when you're a follower of Jesus, the end doesn't justify the means. We don't get to, to engage in the same way because we're a follower of Jesus. Now, this is where the rubber really meets the road here in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. This is the way of Jesus. He's giving us a way to interact. It's not to say that you don't stand up for what's right. You do stand up for what's right. But in your standing up for what's right, what he's saying is even if you have somebody that appears to be an enemy or maybe an enemy of God or the enemy of the kingdom, whatever it is, that we stand up for what's right, but we love them along the way. That's what it's saying. It's saying, hey, you know, there's all this talk about Christians being persecuted and all this stuff coming. It's saying, okay, fine. If that's happening and somebody's cursing you or trying to persecute you, what do you do? You bless them. You don't curse them for curse. You bless them when they curse. It means when you get on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is that you don't send curses back. You send blessing back. You don't enable wrong, but you don't, but you don't meet evil with evil. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the way of Jesus. And he says, pray for those who abuse you. 
How many of you guys know we are to pray for those in leadership, right? Whether they're leadership of your school, leadership of your church, leadership of your country, your city officials. How many of you guys, can we just all agree on that? I mean, that's what the Bible says, right? All right, hesitant hands going up, but all right, I'll take it anyway. I, we're supposed to pray. So what do we do with that? Do we just say, ah, that doesn't count. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? That doesn't count. If God really knew what was going on, he would know that that doesn't count in this situation, right? So what, what I would say is this. If you prayed for the last president, I sure hope you're praying for this one. And if you're praying for this one, I sure hope you'll pray for the next one. Because that's the way of Jesus. Now, some of you might say, well, yeah, but the last one was this, or this one is this, and they're messed up, and whatever your opinion is, if you think that your guy, whoever it is, is, or is good and the other guy is bad, how much more should you be praying for the other guy? He needs it. But if we're not doing it, we're not following the way of Jesus. I know this is hard to hear, but Jesus said a lot of things that are hard to hear. And believe me, it's not easy to say. How would you like to be me right now, right? I just say them as I get them, okay? He says, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. These are hard things to hear. It's not to say to be a pushover. It's saying you don't always have to win to win. That's what it's saying. It says, give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do so to them. It's saying, love your neighbor as yourself, even if you don't agree with them, even if they're cursing you, even if they appear to be an enemy. Love them as you would love to be loved. Pray for them. Don't mock. Pray. Mocking is easy. Prayer is hard. So we stand up for what's, right, for what's right, but we do it in a way that honors the way of Jesus. Worship team can come back. We're getting ready to receive communion because I think by now we all need it. <clears throat> so how do you, how do you know? I, I love what Pastor Brady Boyd said. You know, somebody asked him the question, how do I know when I've crossed a line in engaging in these types of things? You've crossed a line when you are no longer demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. So you, can, you should be engaged, but the moment you lose your love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things, the moment you abandon them, you may have the what right, but you've abandoned the way. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you do not have to abandon the way in order to do the what. The kingdom who informs the what and the way. Let me give you one last story here. You remember that Peter and Jesus and all the disciples are in the garden and you know, Judas comes to betray him. And what does Peter do? He takes his sword and he cuts off the guy's ear. He's like, we'll take care of this, right? Which really is like, he's a bad shot. I mean, I don't know what he was going for there, but, but he just, you know, he's trying. And Jesus says, put away the sword. And Jesus does what? Picks up the guy's ear, slaps it on, heals the guy. He's saying, there's a certain way we're going to do this. And it's not the way of being weaponized. It's a way of being a cultivator of healing and hope. That's how we're going to do it. It's like when, when we're going to do it, we're going to do it this way. We're, we're going to be cultivators. You know, Isaiah talked about how one day we will beat our swords into plowshares. Saying one day we're going to go away from the idea of weaponizing everything to being cultivators of flourishing. And you say, we're not there yet. Ah, we, we're not. But we're also called to live and lean in prophetically into the day that is to come as believers. We are to be the salt and light. We are to be the city on the hill. That, that when somebody sees us, they say, ah, they're doing it a different way. But God has called us to be faithful to the way of Jesus. So here's my question. Has my who informed my what and way? Or let me ask it in a little different way. Has my highest and weightiest who 
inform my what and way, or am I being co-opted by lesser identities to inform my what and way? And as we come to the table, that's not, I just use, I use the example of, of political things to get your attention, but you apply this to any area that you're going through right now. You can apply it to your family. You can apply it to your business. Come on, we need to apply this to our businesses, by the way, too, that the who informs the what and way. We do that as believers. To our finances, to everything, right? This is a lens or a thing that you can use to use in any and every area of your life. And if we want to be faithful followers of Jesus, we have to be aware that we tend to drift. And we ought to frequently step back and ask, am I living for my highest and weightiest identity? And if not, what do I need to surrender right now? What way do I need to surrender? Maybe there's a what I need to surrender. And so as we come to the table, there's tables in front, there's tables in the back. We're gonna be reminded that Jesus demonstrated a crazy way from the natural perspective that he was willing to lay down his life for people who were mocking him and betraying him. And that even while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing. We're reminded as we come to the table that Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. He took the cup and he said, drink this. This, is my, this represents my blood that's gonna be spilled out for you. That what you're getting ready to enter is so transformational that it will affect the what and the way you do things for the rest of your life. Are you in? Are you in? That's what he was asking his disciples and I believe that's his call to every single one of us. So as we come to the table, let's remind ourselves that we're in. Let's remind ourselves that Jesus, I'm, I'm all in. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. I'm gonna follow him all the days of my life. Would you guys stand up with me and I'm gonna pray. Then during this song, we're gonna grab the elements, go back to your seat, have a moment with God, and we'll end with worship. Lord, we surrender to you today. Lord, would you take my words and use them however you need to use them, filter them however you need to filter them. Lord, I pray that at the end of the day, that Holy Spirit, that you would use them to bring fruit in our life that looks like the kingdom. So as we come to the table, we're reminded of your sacrifice how you died in our place, you took our place, you took our sins, you paid the punishment, you paid the price. You rose from the dead so that we might live free. But with that freedom, it's a narrow way. And so Lord, we choose to walk in that. We choose to walk in that way. And we honor you today in Jesus' name, amen. Let's come receive.